let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this morning, for the time to study, and for each person who takes the time each morning um, to join us, and also for those that watch on the internet. Um, we ask, Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit can be with each one. May you speak to our hearts. May you correct our errors in understanding. We know how frail we are as humans, how little we know and understand, and uh, we just pray for wisdom. Help us as we sort through the line of Noah here this morning. Uh, give us guidance and direction, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. So today we're going to sort through the line of Noah, the reform line of Noah. And what, I, what you have, what you see in front of you, I did send this out in an email. This is Prophetic Keys Manual. Um, Heidi and I received a hard copy of this when we were students at the School of the Prophets. Stephen would have as well. And um, this is just a PDF copy that I found um, on my computer from 2014. So I think that's about when it was produced, uh, probably for the School of the Prophets by Jeff. Um, and, and could have been taken from different notes that he had prepared for other studies. Um, and this is on page 65, and this is where it's dealing with the reform line of Noah. Now it's going to deal with these other reform lines. So I'm just going to flip back here a bit. Um, so the one that they're going to use for the model of this uh, is uh, the decrees first. So. Uh, the way marks of every reform line. So it's going to go through darkness, the time of the end, um, and then it's going to the increase of knowledge, the formalization of the message, the message being empowered when divine symbols descends. It talks about the foundation being laid, the worldwide extent of that message. And then it talks about the second decree. In this case, this would be the second message. And in this time, it's going to have the work of the enemies. So one of the things I find when I look at these different um, materials on reform lines is there's lots of inconsistencies. That is, um, at different times, looking at different reform lines, they, they put things in, in slightly different order. Um, and that would be just over time that we came to understand the reform lines a little bit more detailed. Um, but you know, somebody just looking at it, they would say, well, this is kind of a bit a bit confusing because they say this one time and they say this another time. But um, we're gonna see that uh, uh, there's a reason why that problem exists. And I think it's because you're zooming into different reform lines or different way marks within reform lines. And it's not always clear where we are. And, and there is a way to sort it out. And that's what we're trying to do right now. Then you'll see it's going to have the third decree. And then what they do, of course, with this story is they're going to have the fourth be Nehemiah's decree, which my argument is that this fourth in the story of Nehemiah is not um, the same fourth that you would see when we try to look at our history compared to Millerite history. That is, the fourth is actually the first generation. It's the first of the falling away that happens in a progressive uh, destruction of four. So they're gonna have the disappointment, they're gonna have the number seven, they're gonna have all these things under Ezra's, and then they're gonna have this backsliding and then the fourth decree. So, um, but that fourth decree is really just the first generation. So we will see that, and we have talked about it before. Now, so they're going to go through that. They're going to go through also um, uh, the other one is uh, the Exodus, and then they go through um, Elijah as well. Um, so they're not putting them here in chronological order. That's Elijah, I believe. Um, 
Oh, so I gotta go back here. So maybe this was this was Noah. Yeah, so this is okay. That's the uh, that's the line of Christ there. And then they have the reform line of Noah. So they didn't put them in order. They didn't see that these lines are connected um, by a progressive destruction of four. So they're just kind of put in a random order, maybe of I'm not sure why this order exists. I could only guess. So maybe it's just the way that they had it. So when you look at this reform line of Noah, and we're going to be drawing this out and trying to sort through this, um, it talks about darkness. And that's the wickedness of man that was great in the earth. And that the every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So when we look at the time of the end, though, there, he's going to mark the time of the end as when Noah basically is called. And of course, we can see the logic in that. The only thing that we see is that we don't see a time prophecy marking that time of the end. The time prophecy is going to be given that's going to end in the year of the flood, the 120 years. So Noah is not at the end of this time prophecy, at least from how we understand this. And, and the other time prophecy we have is connected with the life of Methuselah. And both of those are going to end in the year of the flood, in our understanding of them. So to say that the time of the end is really at the beginning of this 120 years is, is what would be suggested. And, and that just seems kind of backwards, but may, maybe there's something to that. Uh, and I have some ideas that we can look at regarding that. And then the message is going to be this reform message. And of course, that's logical because Noah's going to be preaching for this 120 years while he's building the ark. And then we also see the act, the, now they're going to say that the second message is the activity of the enemies. Now, the activity of the enemies normally had happened uh, during the first angel's message. So here in this study, they're putting the activity of the enemies after the second message arrives. But we didn't do that later. So, so this was done probably in 2014. At least that's the, the dating on the PDF I have. So we're, we're going to just try to deal with this point here before we um, go on to the third message. So they're going to have the manifestation of the power of God as being the animals coming into the ark. So that would be the midnight cry, basically. And then you have the, do the shut door. So what's missing here in this, because this is quite a, a very simple, simple line. There isn't a lot here. One is we don't even see the empowerment of the first angel's message, particularly unless you're going to say um, the reform is that. There isn't uh, a divine symbol coming down to empower the first angel's message. Or is there something that we're doing wrong with this line of Noah? Because it's going to have the second angel's message in power. That's going to be the animals coming. So any thoughts on this initially? I don't know if people spent some time looking at this yesterday. Now, we talked a little bit about Noah, whether he was a gathering pro prophet or a proclaiming prophet. And um, what did the chart tell us? I think it was uh, him being both, both. Well, we said he should be both. No, that's right, yeah. Yeah, I would think so, too, if it was be both. Um, I'm going to bring up here, so this is the chart, you can see that there, 
So they just have Noah being a gathering prophet. Enoch, they have as the proclaiming prophet. So Enoch, you know, what, what is his prophecy specifically? Well, he'd be a proclaiming prophet. Yeah, he's a proclaiming prophet, and his message is about the second coming. But also, what else does he do that connects him to the flood? Uh, would that be the naming of his child? Yeah, so the naming of Methuselah. So that would that would connect that to the flood. So he he's a proclaiming prophet and he names his son Methuselah. Now, so normally when we look at a proclaiming prophet, a proclaiming prophet is the one who gives the time prophecy. And when that time prophecy is fulfilled, then you have the gathering prophet who acts. So I'm um, question here, wouldn't that be a time prophecy by uh, naming him what he did? Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, it's a limited time prophecy because you don't know how long your son is going to live other than that he's not going to live to be more than a thousand years old. So, so you're putting a time limit uh, with that. Now, we also have the case of the ages of the patriarchs and the symbolic representation there as well. Um, so, so there's, there's something happening here that we generally had not recognized in the past, at least um, in trying to understand this line, we had um, some weaknesses, let's say. Um, now we know that Enoch, when is he born? What year of the world? So I'm gonna to switch to this here. So there's, there's lots of little things we have to look at that I don't think we generally have understood. Okay, so here's the list of the births of the patriarchs. So what do we see with Enoch? Six, 622, I think. Okay, so 622. And what's the significance of that? Well, didn't you do something on uh, the 226 and 622 earlier? Well, okay, so the 622 is a symbol for future for America. And that is Jeff noted that in 2011, on June 22nd, he received $165,000 to start the School of the Prophets. And the first camp meeting that they had in Arkansas after that was um, on June 22nd, 2014, three years later. So he had noted this, and the center date between those two is December 21st, 2012, which starts this line of, which has four, 707, four 777 day periods uh, with a period of time in between uh, of 183 days. And the center date of that whole structure is June 22nd, 2017, which is three years after uh, June 22nd, 2014. And there, so there's a bunch of significance in the structure. June 22nd is, of course, the date that Samuel Snow wrote his Pentecost letter. That is, his third letter is dated on June 22nd. And, and so that becomes a symbol as well that ties Samuel Snow, his letters, to 
this movement and specifically to 2017. So, so there's lots of things that um, we dealt with 622, but we also have a number of 622s. We have 622 AM, 622 BC, 622 AD. And what's the significance of 622 BC? So this is 622 AM, the birth of Enoch. What's 622 BC? Does anybody remember that date? In, in Ezekiel chapter one, verse one, he says it's the 30th year. So that's in three, nine, or 592 BC that he talks about it being the 30th year. So 622 would be the first year. And what happens in 622 BC that Ezekiel is referencing? Does anybody remember? So in six, yeah, and that was the Passover of, um, uh, I can't remember this guy's name, just Josiah. Josiah. Josiah, right. It's the Passover of Josiah. So, so Ezekiel is, is tying to the Passover of Josiah, and then he's going to be dealing with the prophecy of Josiah in chapter four. So, but it's 622 BC. Now, 622 AD is on july 18th at sunset begins the islamic calendar so the, the islamic calendar um is is using 622 a.d which is the flight from mecca uh, as the first year to start their calendar it starts from that era and if you use their calendar um, and you go back to the first day of the first month it's going to be uh at sunset on July 18th. The other thing that's interesting too, though, is see that's that's sort of the retroactive calendar. But if you go to the um, the actual calendar that would have been used in 622 BC, the first day of the first month is April 19th in 622 on the Islamic calendar. It's just that uh, I'm not going to go and explain it right now. It's just that the calendar originally had had 13 months added in some of the years, but it didn't after 10 years later. So in 632, when um, uh, Muhammad dies and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, or not al-Baghdadi, Abu Bakr uh, becomes the first caliph, they're not going to uh, be adding 13th, 13th month anymore. So there's, um, basically three extra months that you would have to go back and that would bring you to April 19th is actually uh, the first day of the first month on the Islamic calendar in 622. So I know it's a long explanation, but that's actually the short explanation. Um, so, so we have 622. So the significance of 622 is that it ties us to future for America, but we know that how many days is it before um, Lamech is born? So Lamech, so Methuselah is going to be born 65 years later, and Lamech is going to be born 187 years later. So from the time of Enoch being born to Lamech being born is how many years? Enoch, 622, 874 minus 622. You could just add 65 Looks like 252. Yeah, 252, right? So you have this symbol, 622 AM, and it's followed by uh, 
65 years, which is a symbol that we get from the prophetic mirror, and then 187 years, which is, of course, a symbol of July 18th. And that's going to mark the birth of Lamech, 252 years after the birth of Enoch. And then Lamech, we know, lives for 777 years. So you can see all of these symbols are connected with this movement at the present time. So we have to say that there's something about the time of Enoch and, and the birth of Methuselah and the birth of Lamech that are connected to the timing of the flood. So people kind of see what's happening here, that there's something that when it comes to the reform line of Noah, it doesn't just come out of nowhere. And we need to we need to sort of grasp, is there a time of the end that's connected with Noah himself, just as as they did uh, in this study, but that we don't recognize why that is. So we know Noah is going to be born. 182 years after Lamech. So, um, and Ron, your mic is on and it's pretty noisy. So, now I don't, I don't want to work through this just on my own. I want you guys to sort of help me sort this out of what you think is happening here. So we have, we have Enoch and we know that he's important. Um, 65 years after Enoch is born, he's going to have his son Methuselah, who he gives a, a sort of a limited time prophecy to, that when he dies, it will come. So, so that, that, that means that there's something that's coming, the end of something, and Enoch sees this. But he also prophesies regarding uh, the second coming of Christ. We also know that he's the seventh generation as well. So we shouldn't forget that part regarding Enoch. So he's connected to a symbol of the seven times being the seventh generation. What other things should we take note of here regarding Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah? Anything else? Anybody have any thoughts about what we see happening here? I want you to sort of think out loud. Uh, just that Lamech is number eight. Okay, so um, Lamech is the ninth generation. Methuselah is the eighth generation. Now, we do know that Lamech is 187 years um, after the birth of Methuselah. And Lamech, if we take his name and we multiply those letters together, we get 18720. So we get a symbol of July 18, 2020 with Lamech uh, in that way, plus we get the 777 years.
Now, um, so Lamech is born in the year 874. Now he's going to, does anybody know how long it is that he dies before the flood? Now he dies before uh, Methuselah. So Methuselah dies in the year of the flood. So it's five years before the flood that Lamech dies. Isn't that another symbol? Yeah, symbol of the five is the five wise, the five foolish. Okay, so there's so there's a symbol there. Um, so the question that I have, though, is do we have some different lines? That is, we know that in Millerite history, we have the lines, the line, the main line. But we also have the line of Samuel Snow. And, and, and in a sense, we have two lines for Samuel Snow. We have one which is Samuel Snow's letters. And, and we have two chiasms with Samuel Snow's letters. One where April 19th is the center of a chiasm of 126 days with uh, symbolically 391 and a half days pointing to July 18th, his last letter. We also have one just where the center of his letters from the writing of the first one to the publication of the last one is May 2nd, which is a Passover and it's the center of a chiasm and it's his publication of his second letter. So, so we have that. We also have that Samuel Snow presents a message at Boston and Exeter. So he has a preliminary message that is given that is typical of the bigger line and then he participates in the giving of that message and in the bigger line itself. So, so we know there's something happening with these lines that we, that we never noticed in the past. That is, we would not have looked at Lamech. Uh, we might have, of course, looked at Enoch because we would say, well, he's proclaiming this coming flood even though he's doing it in the language of the second coming. And he's also naming his son Methuselah. But we can see that there's more happening here. That, that, that there's some complexity within these lines that, that had gone unnoticed, and, and we need to address it. We need to sort through it. Okay, so maybe I will go to the whiteboard and draw this out. Interesting thing there, too, is that the 11th generation starts 500 years later. Yeah, so you're saying... Um, that span of time is much larger than the ones previous. So you're referring to uh, what specifically to... The generation uh, of Sam, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Yeah, so that, so that they're going to be born 100 years... That is, uh, Japheth would be born a hundred years before the flood, right? Because the flood's going to happen in Noah's six hundredth year, and so you're going to have Japheth born first, and then probably Shem, and then Ham, or maybe Ham and then Shem. We don't know, um, but Japheth is going to be the eldest one. Is that what you're referring to? That 500 years there? Chris? Oh, um, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was muted. Okay. Um, the births of the sons are uh, before Noah has Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They're like, you know, less than 200 years after the, uh, the previous ones. But here was 500 years. Okay, I see what you're saying. So from the time that Noah is born to when he has his sons. Yes. Okay. Quite a bit longer distance time-wise. 
Yeah, so so Noah is 500 years old when he has Japheth, which is is kind of odd. And and Shem is born um, two years after Japheth, which is why we think that Ham is probably uh, the youngest. Now, and, and it's just kind of odd. So I mean, people have noted these things before. They say we we look at these these ages, and um, you know, Enoch's going to have his first child, Methuselah, when he's 65. And then Noah's going to have Shem, Ham, and Japheth when he's 500. Now, what, I mean, the Bible isn't giving us a lot of detail. And we could read into these things. Um, I mean, there may be a lot happening that just is not being told us because it's not relevant. Okay, you're seeing just a blank board, correct? Because I'm going to go up to the whiteboard. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, he just started asking about this. So let's go there and try to see if we can make sense out of this. So we got these, this is a period, so we got you know, year one here, year 1656 here. So this is gonna be the year of the flood. And in here we have, um, you know, it's 622 AM, it's 1 AM. And this is gonna be Enoch, right? You're gonna have 65 years, and then you're gonna have 187 years, and then you're going to have which is, this is 252 years. And then you're going to have um, 777 years. So that's going to bring you here. We'll just do it this way. So this is going to be Lamech. And this is going to be five years here. And so if we added that together, 622, 65, 187, 777, and 5. That should add up if we did it right, if I'm doing this, my math right. So that's 14, 15, 16. That looks right, right? 7, 14, 21, 6, carry the 2. That's 10, 18, that's 5, carry the 2, 1656, right? People can see that. So there we have that period of time. And now Noah is going to be uh, beginning his preaching 120 years is how we understand it. This is the time in which Noah builds the ark and does his preaching. And then we have, of course, this time prophecy, if you want to put it that way, of the 969 years. Right? That's the, that's Methuselah. And this time prophecy, so these we say are the two time prophecies as such, that bring us to the year of the flood. But we're going to say that the time of the end is going to be where? Where, where were they putting the time of the end in this study? Where are they going to have the first angel's message being proclaimed? In Elijah. Well, they're going to have the first angel's message being this 120 years um, being proclaimed. And in this first angel's message, 
they're then going to say that somewhere along here, they're going to have uh, the work of the enemies. But they're going to call this the second angel's message. So we're not going to put... Um, so they're going to have the second angel's message being the work of the enemies, which is not usually that way. It's part of the first angel's message in the history of the decrees. So it seems to me kind of odd, but that's how they did it, how Jeff did it in this booklet. And then that's going to be empowered when the animals, that's going to be the, the, the second angel empowered. We'll put it that way. And then you're just going to have the door of the ark closed. And that's going to be the third angel arriving. So this is, this is sort of the line that they have. But we have, and, and they have a proclamation. So they do have the proclamation of the message. So the time of the end actually proceeds in their structure. It precedes the time prophecy by 120 years. That is, the time of the end is here, and yet the time prophecies that we have are the 120 years and the 969 years. So, so you can see that there, there's things that we we have to sort out. We don't understand everything. And, and I think that we need to figure out what's actually happening here. So the question is, what role does Lamech have? Because is he a time prophecy as well? I mean, if we got these, you know, from the birth of Enoch in 622 AM, which is the symbol that we use for FFA and for this message, for this movement, particularly connected to the 777. And we have this 252, which is connected by these two symbols, the 65 years of the prophetic mirror. So this is a symbol of the prophetic mirror, the 65 and the 252. And then we have the 187, which is the symbol of July 18th. And we have Lamech, whose name 11. So if you take, if you take the letters and you multiply those letters, you get 18720, July 1820. And he also lives for 777 years. And he dies five years before the flood. And he's the father, of course, of Noah. How, what is it that we're seeing? How is this all connected together? What, what is God telling us by this structure that we've missed in the past? Because we have a reform line here, the reform line of Noah, which is, is kind of a sparse reform line compared to other reform lines. Is there two reform lines here? So would we then be looking for another progressive destruction of four between them? No, because they're they're with within a reform line. There are reform lines that are parts of the way marks. That is, when you zoom into a way mark, it has a reform line in and of itself. Right? So every way mark is a reform line. So those don't have progressive destructions of four between them. It's just the major way marks that do. Sometimes secondary way marks will have a progression, progressive destruction of four as well. But you don't expect to see a progressive destruction of four between the arrival of the first angel's message in 1798 and its formalization um, in 1833. 
then you don't see, expect to see a progressive destruction of four between the formalization of the message and its empowerment on August 11th, 1840. But you are going to see the characteristics of a reform line in each one of those waymarks. And, and those reform lines can show up for different groups of people uh, depending on uh, what's being illustrated. Because even when you think about the reform line of the formalization of the message. So if you can visualize Millerite history here for a minute, remember in 1833, Miller, for, we mark that as the formalization of the message because he receives his credentials. Now, he began to preach that message two years previous in 1831. That was when he first was invited to speak. That's the one where he goes out in the back and, and prays. And then finally his nephew, he goes, he's, he agrees that he's gonna go uh, preach that Sunday. And, and he knows he has to present this message. You know, that Jesus is coming back in about 25 years from the time that he first came to understand that, which was 1880, 1818. Now is 1818, and 1816, the Battle of Plattsburgh, are these connected to the formalization of the message as a reform line, a personal reform line of William Miller's coming to present the message? You understand what I'm asking? The question is, does William Miller have a personal reform line that leads to him proclaiming the message, formalizing the message that is separate, in a sense, from the bigger reform line? Can people see what I'm saying? Certainly a supporting function or supporting uh, events that took place that led up to him yeah. doing that. And if I would look at Miller's personal reform line, that leads to the for, that's that's really the reform line of the formalization of the message, because it's not just about the formalization of the message. It's about the formalization of the person who's going to give that message. And that's Miller. So when is the time of the end for William Miller? For his personal reform line that's going to deal with the formalization of the message. Anybody know what what event would mark the beginning of the time of the end for William Miller personally? What does William Miller receive in 1798? Bible and concordance. Okay. Now, he's prior to a time of the end, is there a period of darkness? very much is william miller in a period of darkness in 1798 when he receives his concordance yes okay so so miller's in this period of darkness i'm just going to switch this screen here and switch my mic okay so then receiving a concordance is that connected to an increase of light Yes. So just, be. just with this here, at least we can look at a line and, and we can see here what, what, what we're talking about, at least it helps us visual, visualize this a bit. So just imagine this is just a line. It could be any line, um, but, but we're going to use it as Miller's line. So we're just going to ignore what's above there a little bit, but just say in 1798 in Miller's personal line, he receives a concordance, and that's an increase of light. So what would be the formalization of that increase of light for him personally? Um, his credentials? I would almost think it would be 1813 with the understanding of, uh, of the Bible.
what, what's going what's happening with Miller from 1798 to uh, 1816 let's say he's studying to prove the Bible wrong Is he struggling? He's, he's going through some experiences where he is going to, to be doing what? What's, what's, what's Miller's history? He's struggling, but he's seeing the providences of God. I want to say he was in war and he um, noticed okay, something. We know that he's going to be at the Battle of Plattsburgh on September 11th, uh, 1816, right? Yeah, that's what I was talking Is about. Is that a way mark in Miller's personal line? I would have to say yes. And if you were going to put it as a way mark in Miller's personal line, where would you put it? Would you mark it as 1AA, 1AF, 1AE, 2AA? Where would you place that? I'm going to do this here. I'm going to. Uh, I would say possibly 1AF. I'm just duplicating the slide so I don't get rid of that other one. And I'm going to make, get rid of this. So we're going to do Miller's line. Let's just try this. So we're going to say this uh, up above is going to be 1798. And he's going to get a concordance here. And then he's going to have an increase of knowledge which is going to be the knowledge of sin. Then there's going to be a formalization of a message and an empowerment. Now, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say that this one here is September 11th. What year? 1816. People get, understand what I'm getting at. So September 11th, 1816, we have the Battle of Plattsburgh. And what happens there? Is that an empowerment of the message? Does a mighty That's angel when... come down to empower the message? on September 11th, 1816, for Miller I would, personally. I think so, because of his realization of what that battle represented. Okay, I can't hear anybody. Are people trying to talk? I have been trying to talk. Can you hear me at all? So something's wrong. Okay, now, now I can hear people, I think, right? Can you hear me? Okay, now I can hear you. Sorry about that. Somehow I ended up clicking the wrong button and stopped the sound. Okay, so people weren't saying anything, but you were. I just didn't hear you. Okay. Okay, so, so the empowerment, um, it's quite possible because of the conditions of that battle and what he came up with during that battle. Okay, we know a mighty angel came down. Did he see a, does a divine angel come down? at the Battle of Plattsburgh, not literally, but he saw God's hand. So prior to this, he's a deist, correct? Correct. He just believes that God exists. He created the world, but he has no personal interest in what is happening. We're kind of left on our own, but he sees that God has actually had a hand in that victory on the Battle of Plattsburgh. I agree. 
and, and or Lake Champlain, depending on which which landmark you use. Okay, so then we know that uh, we're also going to have a 9 11 in 18, um, and I got these dates wrong. So this is 1814, pardon me, and this is 1816, right? So excuse me, I made, had made a mistake there. So 1814 is the Battle of Plattsburgh, and 1816 is the two-year anniversary of the Battle of Platt, Plattsburgh, and what happens in 1816? So 1814 is the Battle of Plattsburgh, two-year anniversary, what happens? They're going to have this celebration and a preacher's going to come and they were planning a ball but they cancel the ball because of the conviction that they have. And, and that begins two years of study. And in 1818, he comes to understand that um, Christ is going to come back in about 25 years, right? And in 1831, He's going to do his first preaching and remember that this is a miracle, right? He prays to God and God is going to, uh, he says to God, he makes a deal. You know, I know you, uh, you, I have this conviction to proclaim this message, but unless somebody comes and asks me to proclaim it, I'm not going to proclaim it. And then his nephew comes to the door and says, can you preach this Sunday? And so William Miller then struggles. And would we say that's an empowerment of the second angel's message in the personal life of William Miller? Well, and considering that, the arrangement that he made with God, yes, I would say so. Yeah, and then you're also going to have, he gets his credit credentials in 1833, right? Now, the only one we haven't addressed is this formalization of the message. And, and this would be his personal struggle that he's going through, even though he's not uh, studying the Bible. Um, he, he's, tr he's trying to sort out his personal faith. And so I I'm just going to put this, I, I don't have a specific year, but we'll just say uh, this is actually a struggle that he goes through, a personal struggle. But that's going to be then empowered when he's at the Battle of the Plains of, of Plattsburgh, right? So we can see that he has this personal struggle, and then it's empowered, right? So now he makes his decision for God. And then you can see in our line, see how these 9-11s line up? That there's two lot 911s in the personal way mark of William Miller, and there's two 911s in our line. You see that? Now that you lay it on the line, it's obvious you can see it. Okay. Now, this is all just the line that I would call the formalization of the message. That is, 1833 is the year we mark as the formalization of the message, but it's something that occurs in the life of William Miller. It's actually not just the formalization of the message, but also of the messenger. So we will see this in each line, that each way mark can have a line to it. And that we could see this, we, could, we can do the same thing with Jeff's formalization. He's going to have a personal formalization, which which ends in 1996 with the publication of um, the Time of the End magazine, right? But we could take Jeff's life 
and find a very similar type of line. Because we know that Jeff in 1989 first begins to study the message of the chain of truth and starts to understand the repeat of Millerite history. And, and we know we have other things like 1993, his, his booklet, Prophetic Lines. And then we could probably take his whole struggle, like even the work of the enemies and so forth, uh, in getting that book published, you know, so, so there's lots that can be done with these lines. They're not always going to look identical. Um, the line of William Miller works out really, really well. Some of them are going to be very short lines. That is, they're just going to have a little bit of detail. Uh, they don't have as, as many events, at least that we know of. But, but you can see what we're doing here, right? This, this makes a lot of sense. That it's not just, and, and, and I've done this with lots of other lines as well, and we're going to be doing this. So when we go to the story of Noah, we should expect that there, that sometimes when we're looking at a reform line, we're looking at a reform line that's just a way mark within a larger reform line. And of course, the largest reform line is this cosmic line, right, that we see here. The creation of, from the creation of the heaven and earth to the new heaven and the new earth. Um, now, we also see things that are interesting regarding the story of the flood is that these lines also give us a mirror at times. So when we look at the Sunday law, we can see that this is about a flood just like this one is, correct? And we can see here literal Israel and spiritual Israel on either side, with the center being the cross. And of course, we can see the new heaven and the new earth on either side. So we can clearly see the mirror in the cosmic line. Now, another thing that we can see about the flood, though, is in this story of the flood, the symbols that exist in this movement also exist in that line of the flood, starting with Enoch, the seventh from Adam, and the 65 years and the 187 years, which make two, 252 years, and then the 777 years of Lamech. So even before we understood this cosmic line, we were tying the symbols that are happening in our line, which is, is a and, and our line specifically, I'm not, because this is the Sunday law. Remember, we're part of this Sunday law waymark. But our line itself is a waymark that is zoomed into just as the flood waymark is zoomed into. And, and we, we're going to see that there's levels in which when we look at these reform lines, we look at these waymarks that we sometimes get confused about which reform line we're looking at. Are we looking at the reform line of the flood? Or are we looking at the reform line of Noah? Or, or even, you know, some, some way mark within the flood? Because we went through the chronology of the flood, and it has a whole bunch of symbols in it. But yet, the door closes before the rains even begin. And so the question is, why all that chronology? Why all that detail? What is it that it's trying to tell us? So, so you can see the complexity that, that, that starts to, to happen. But the complexity also helps bring clarity. Once you start to understand something in its details, you start to be able to put it together. Like the wheels within a wheel, it looks complex. It's involved. We can't make sense out of it. But as you start to understand the different parts, you start to see how they fit together. And that's what's happening right now with this movement as we begin to look at these lines 
in much more detail, we start to see the connectedness of these different reform lines and also correctly discern the structure of the individual reform lines or waymarks. Now, I'm going to try to, as, as we go through these studies, I'm going to start to take each of these lines and expand them out. So the cosmic line is, is our big line, but I could take the cosmic line, I probably should have it at the top, and, and then you would see that this line is just the first part of this way mark, right? Which we talked about. So this way mark actually has three way marks within it, the first, second, and third. But this one here is just the first of this first, right? And, and so as we go through, I'm gonna create charts like this for each of the way marks so you can see them expanded out. It's like a tree with its branches. Is this, is this starting to make more sense? Especially looking at the way mark of, or the, or the reform line of Miller. And any thoughts or questions? I begin to see the significance of the two 911s in our line. Yeah, yeah. No, no you're not always going to see everything as clear as this one, but this one is nice and clear that you can see that there is this, this connection. Now, we also have this type of thing exist in Samuel Snow's letters, which I'm going to, uh, um, we're going to start to see that Samuel Snow's when we get there, but we're going to see that Samuel Snow's has a personal line, as well as uh, the line of his letters. So the line of the, his letters is actually his second angel's message. He has a first angel's message personally as well, and he has a second angel's message. And he also has a third angel's message that exists within his personal line. But then his line is a part of the, of, of the second angel's message of, of the line of the Millerites because he's going to proclaim the second angel's message at Boston and Exeter. So I believe we have the same thing happening in the story of the flood, that we have lines within lines. And when we first look at it, I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with the line that Jeff has, except that it's not the main reform line. It's not the line of the flood. It's actually more the line of Noah. So we're gonna we're gonna go there. So I gotta make sure I do my microphone correctly this time though. Okay, so microphone. Um, I have a question for you. <clears throat> In talking about the personal uh, reform lines, yeah. Um, just is looking at the William Miller personal reform line. The yeah. Lord had to prepare him to do the work that He wanted him to do, mm -hmm. and the same thing had to happen with Noah too, didn't it? Yes. Yeah, so Noah has a personal reform line as well. Yeah, and, th and that's kind of the point that I'm, because, and I don't think it's, it's, it's necessarily really simple, but if we're going to be dealing with Noah here, proclaiming this, during this 120 years, right? So you have this 120 years of the preaching of Noah. We know that the close of probation happens here. So, so there is this reform line. We, we sort of can't ignore it. The thing is this reform line 
has a time of the end, but it has time attached to it. But the time of the end, this, this, um, this history here is, is the reform line of the flood. Or at least it's prefiguring what's going to happen. It's also prefiguring our time. That is, in our time, we have these, we have a message that's connected to the 777 and July 18th and the 2520 that is seen in this history, but it's generally ignored in this reform line. So I'm not sure how to sort it out yet. I mean, all I know is that I see two different reform lines. Now, we, we could actually argue here that this time of the end is just like uh, we see in Genesis, the time of the beginning. We could see that this, this reform line actually begins with the time period rather than ends with the time period. But this time period here is the one that's marking uh, that, that we could say that this is the time of the end as well. Or, or something to that effect. I'm not sure, or the time of the beginning. So it's almost like a reverse, reverse reform line. That is, it ends um, here, but the, reform, but the reform line ends with the time periods, not begins with the time periods. So it's like a mirror. Does that seem reasonable? Is there some other way to look at this? No, it, it looks reasonable. Okay. Um, because it's a mirror, for one. Right, because it's mirroring our time. So, so we, can, we still can accept this reform line, but we just know that this isn't all there is in regard to this that there's this part of this reform line. And I don't know how to name them or distinguish them, but this is all preparatory to the flood. Yeah, right? like pre, pre flood. Yeah, it's a pre flood reform line. But then we're also gonna have the reform line because once that door of the ark closes, we, we somehow have to address because what we what what I think we're doing when we zoom in to the to the flood chronology, let's call it that, that we're actually zooming into this closed door, and we're and it's telling us something about what this closed door represents. Because remember, this closed door is October twenty two, right? Twenty three ninety one BC. Okay, and we have the, you know, 1844, we have an October 22nd closed door as well with the third angel arriving. But these are just types of the end of the world, right? And we know that this close of probation, of course, those people definitely closed their probation when that door closed. That is, God was formally closing their probation. They'd already closed their probation personally. But when the door of the ark closed, probation had closed. But it's not Michael standing up. This is just a way mark, which we would call, um, or we're calling the formalization of the first angel's message on the cosmic line. The, the seven days prior to the door closing, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that seven days that the world looked on uh, at Noah's ship and what had happened. The animals coming, you mean, for the first well, the Animals coming, Noah going into the ship, the door closing. Um, is that all what you're saying happened on October 22? 
Yeah, so that prior to October 22, you have the seven days of the animals, animals coming, and that is a period of probation, yeah. right? Just like 70 is. Yeah. And then you're going to have the door of the ark closed on October 22nd, Julian, which is the 10th day of the seventh month, right? So this is going to be the 10th day of the seventh month because it's in the fall. That's what we tried to show yesterday, that, that that's the best fit. That's the only fit I can find, actually. Not saying that, that I'm correct, but I'm saying that it definitely worked. And then, um, and then you're going to have seven days that they sit in the ark before the rain, rains begin. So it's going to begin raining October 29th. So yeah, that, that period of time was the one I was trying to reference. Okay. That seven days after they went into the ark and the door closed, um, it cemented the people's um, opinions about Noah and made them even more um, critical of what he was doing and what he was preaching. Yeah. And, and of course, we know the seven is the symbol that we get with the, the first reform line with creation, right? So, so you have this seven, and that's going to show up in all these reform lines, the number seven. Yes. Showing up after the third angel arrives. But, but then you're going to have, after that, you're going to have the rains coming. And it's going to rain for 40 days. And then the water is going to pre prevail for 150 days. And then it's going to abate for 150 days. And there's all these different things that happen. And... And the question is, what does that all mean? I mean, it's there for a reason with these specific dates, these specific structures, and it's trying to tell us something. And, and, and I'm not sure I know what it's trying to tell us, other than that it is still part of a reform line, that it's, it's illustrating something, and we need to know what it's illustrating. And it, and it has all these different symbols, you know, the 40 days, the 220 days. It has the 22 days. It has the three one combination of the raven and then the three days of the dove. It has the first day of the first month as a symbol, even though it's technically the first day of the sixth month, but in Noah's life, it's the first day of the first month of his 600th year. 601st year, pardon me, that, that they take the roof off the ark. So, so we have all of these symbols and we have to make sense out of them. And, and so we know that there's this progressive destruction of four, there's this formalization of the message, but there's also a proclamation of the message. And then there's going to be a closed door. That's a characteristic of a reform line. The fact that the time periods begin at the time of the end, in this case, but I would argue that this is the time of the beginning. Um, well, we're going to go here. So this period here is giving us this sense of this structure that we see later in the prophetic mirror of the 2520. And, and it could be that God is just illustrating these symbols at the beginning so that we could understand them at the end. That we could see that they're divinely appointed. Because our history is connected with this history. And another way to look at this is we know that our history is connected to Millerite history. But this in some ways represents Millerite history, the end of the 65 years, and also the 2520. But it also illustrates our history with July 18th and the 777. So it, it's tying Millerite history together with our history. But it's doing this in the history of the flood. Now, I don't know how, how much detail we want to go into. Gonna switch this back. And you can hear me, correct?
Yes. Okay, it didn't flub up this time. Okay. It was never an issue of us hearing you. It was you hearing us. I know. But if I say that you can hear me, then when you say yes, then I know I can hear you. <laughs> okay, fine. I agree. <laughs> yes, I understand. Okay. Um, so we probably, you know, should do something with this. Um, just, I'm going to duplicate the slide again and do a new one. So let me get rid of this. Hang on. So when we have this cosmic line, what we've done here is we're going to take this and this is going to be the line of the flood. Um, and so we just have the general line. We're going to have the close of probation. But we don't have what we don't have marked is so we're going to say this is the flood. I'll just call it the flood. Um, what we don't have marked is is every way mark. So we would say the time of the end is um, it's going to be 120 years before the flood. So Noah's going to be how old? Uh, five, 600 years old. He's going to be 600 years old when the flood begins. So, and that's in um, 2390, right? So I'd have to take 2390 and I'd have to um, add okay. 120 years if I wanted to get the year here. Right. 480 or he's he would have been 480, right? So um so this is gonna be uh 25 um 25 10 years. Whoops. 25. So that's 2510 BC, I think. I think I did that right. 2390 plus 120 is 2510. And that's going to be the beginning of 120 years. Now, so this is going to be the angel arriving. And what that's just the message in Exodus. Um, Chapter six, verse, uh, was it six verse, not Exodus, Genesis chapter six, verse four, was it? Or verse, where is it? Verse three, I, I should remember that because that's the symbol of Pentecost. Okay, so Genesis chapter six, verse three. Okay, does that make sense? We got Genesis 6 3, that's 510 BC. And then the formalization of the message. What 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 event would mark this? I mean, it do we know exactly when Noah was called? Is he going to be called? He would be called in this period of time, but this would be. We'll just call it the call of Noah. How's that? Oops. Does that seem fine? That's the 120 before. Yeah, this is still 120 years before. Both of these are at the same time, but we'll just we'll just call it uh, the call of Noah as a separate way mark, because you have the arrival of the message is the 120 years being proclaimed. The call of Noah is that formalization, and then you would say, uh, what would the, the empowerment be? Is this the building of the ark? 
Yeah, I would think so. Okay, so we'll just say that that's what it is. Okay, now what about the arrival of the second angel? They say it's the work of the enemies. Where normally the work of the enemies occurs under the first angel's message. It's not a separate way mark. So we know the clo the door of the ark is going to close. So I'm just going to put here door closes. Tenth day, seventh month. Technically, it's 2391 BC that the door closes. Okay, so what are we going to put in for the second angel's message? And this is just, just you know, um, us trying to work through this. They say it's the work of the enemies. Could we say that the work of the enemies is tied to this? Now, they said the empowerment was the animals coming into the ark. Is that correct? Would we say that's the empowerment? Because it, it has a divine symbol attached to it. The angels are the ones that lead them. So would the formalization be the preaching of no? Yeah. Yeah, and, and normally formalization is some kind of message. So the warning message, we could say. So, I mean, he's going to make an appeal to the people. Whether you know you want to, but I would put the animals here, even though there's a warning message there. So the question is then, if we're going to have that as the second angel, what is the second angel arriving as? Could we say? And, and, and there's different ways we could look at this. This isn't the, necessarily the only way. We could say, you know, the formalization is the building of the ark. Uh, the finishing of the ark is the empowerment of the message. You know, we don't know Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We're not marking them at all in this. Do they have a part to play in, in this message? You know, there's lots of ways this can be done. So I'm not saying that, you know, you could have the call of Noah, the empowerment, you could be the birth of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, the second angel arriving could be the building of the ark, because we don't know exactly, did he start building the ark right from the time he was called? We don't know exactly. You know, we, we sort of infer that it, it is that way, because we talk about 120 years of building the ark. But, you know, his sons aren't going to be born um, until, uh, you know, 20 years after he's called. So maybe there's a preparation work that's being done. You, you, see, the, you see the issue, right? Any suggestions? You know, because I almost rather have uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth here. Terrible taker. Okay. Shem, Ham, and Japheth there. And then I would put the building of the heart arc here. Isn't it Shem with an M, not an N? Yeah, 
you're correct. And you always have to point out my mistakes, don't you? And then the finishing of the arc. So that's just... Um, hey, that's a really bad spelling there, bro. I know. It's corrected now. So you got the finishing of the arc. Then the animals, that's the empowerment. So to me, this, you know, this works. But it's it's just a thought, right? So, so I can't. The second angel is usually a visual reference. Which is the building of an arc. Which is also the finishing and also the animal. Yeah. So they all have the visual. The visual. So and, and right now, you know, we're, we're trying to look at each of these lines, at least a sketch of them. And as we start going through different lines, we might start to go back to some of these lines and say, well, you know, as we look at different lines, we see these different connections. Because we're not even mentioning all the different characteristics that that lines have here. We're just we're just trying to line them up initially here with these seven way marks that each message has an arrival of formalization and empowerment and um, and that we come to the third and we're going to have the number seven represented right now this is the seventh way mark so but we know the new heavens and the new earth that's going to be the thousand years is connected there here it's the seven days that they're sitting in the ark after the door closes before the rains fall and and now we're going to have to deal with what we think the chronology of the flood means. So we're going to look at that uh, tomorrow. So again, you know, I keep I keep asking for reassurance that people are following this and that it's useful to them, this type of process, because I'm not coming with the answers, with the finished conclusions. I'm just making suggestions. But you can see as as we look at this, um, it, it's going to give us a greater understanding of the lines. Instead of just accepting the lines that were given to us and, and just accepting those way marks, we need to reverse engineer these. We need to look at each of the lines and try to build it again. Now, the only other thing that we have is when we look at this line, we know that there's this other line, this line of uh, from Enoch all the way to the year that the flood occurs. And that's connected by Enoch and the birth of his son, Methuselah. But we also have um, Lamech connected there too. So, so I don't know how to fit that in, how, how we would describe that. Wouldn't Lamech be the bridge between the line of Enoch and the line of Noah? Yep, he is. But the question is, how would we draw that line out as, you know, time of the end? I mean, we didn't, we didn't draw it out. We could, maybe that's what we'll spend a bit of time uh, tomorrow. Because we need to look at that line dealing from Enoch and try to see what that means. But then also the chronology of the flood, which we worked through, but we haven't, we haven't given it, um, we haven't put it on a line like this. And the question is, can we? Can I would think we that suggest, possible. I'm sorry. Okay, My fault, go ahead. Okay, Ron first then. At, at, okay. Um, now I've lost train of thought. Go ahead, Dwight. In, in, this, in this type of situation, mm -hmm. I think all of these are something that we have to work through because we cannot depend on what other people have done. The more we work through this on our own, the more we come to understand it on our own. And the more we can defend the thought process on our own. 
Yes. And, yeah. and, it, and it's useful for me sharing this in front of you guys, but you do have to do this yourself. So are we calling Enoch's line a reform line? That, that's the question. I would say it is. We, but it's we have beginning to, to look like that. Yeah, we haven't drawn it yet, like as far as the different way marks. It seems to me that we're going to have to start putting out more lines of the different players. Yeah. Now, see, the way that I would look at it is when you look at Millerite history, we can see that Samuel Snow has a couple of lines, and his lines are typical of the bigger line. In, in that case, the bigger line is the Millerite line for him. And we can see that this occurs in the story of the flood as well, that there isn't just the, the flood, the, story, the line of Noah, as they call it, that there is this line that they never noticed before that ties symbolically to our line. And it's a typical line. That is, it's, it's typifying and illustrating the, the line that it's a part of. That is, I would say that the line of Lamech um, connected with Enoch in that is a part of the arrival of the first angel's message. So it's connected to the start of the 120 years. It's giving us information about the line of the flood itself. But then we also have the flood chronology, and we have to try to understand what that means. <clears throat> now, in some ways, there is this mirror aspect to this flood story that I find interesting because of where it is in the cosmic line. That is sometimes when you have a line, um, and this is what Stephen was talking about the other day with the candlestick, that there is this, this idea that the first and seventh are connected, the second and the sixth and the third and fifth. And that they will have mirror aspects to them, even though the overall line is progressing, progressing as a as a reform line. That you can see this and you can see that in the cosmic line quite clearly. And, and so since this flood line is a mirror of our line, the Sunday law way mark on the cosmic line. Then we would have to say that the fact that it has mirror aspects that we don't that that we can kind of accept that and then we would look at this chronology of the flood because the chronology of the flood to me is is one of the most fascinating as aspects of scripture one is just how it works but also its connection to um you know the this calendar connection that gives us this connection to these other lines. So, so those are things we're gonna to have to sort out. I don't know if we can sort that all out tomorrow, but tomorrow is the last study this week. And, and we're gonna see what we can accomplish. But we need a lot of prayer and we need a lot of personal study in this. Um, and, and we definitely need God sorting this out for us. I mean, he wants us to cooperate with him but it's not like we can intellectually just do this. And, and we may not even fully understand the benefit of doing this, even though we can see it now, we don't know what God's purposes are. That is, as far as developing a message to give to the Seventh-day Adventist church, to the Levites, we don't know what's going to be the key that's going to reach them. We don't know the future. We don't know, you know, we don't like, you know, he that considereth the wind does not sow. He that considereth the clouds does not reap. I don't know if you're familiar with that scripture. And, and we also have to put our hand to whatever. We never know what's going to prosper, this or that. So we have a lot of work before us. But God is guiding this work if we allow him to. And, and he's going to give us the light we need when we need it. And we will see why it was so essential that we spent this time going through this in such detail. So any final thoughts?
Okay, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, again, we are amazed at the things that we find in your word. We are so thankful for this history that was recorded in the scriptures and for the sacred history of Millerite history, the events in Miller's life that were providentially written down so that we could see these patterns and these structures. We know that this sometimes can be or seem like an intellectual exercise, but Lord, we ask that it can reach our heart. I pray that you can be with each one, that you can work in their lives in a powerful way. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.